Hi, and welcome to Stefan Levera Podcast. Today, for episode 228, have you wondered what goes into the decision around why and how a Bitcoin exchange comes to support Bitcoin development? Hong Fang, CEO of OKCoin, joins me to discuss. This show is brought to you by Swan Bitcoin. In their effort to spread Bitcoin knowledge and awareness, Swan is giving away a free book, Inventing Bitcoin, rated 4.9 stars by Swan co-founder Jan Pritzker. To get your free ebook or audiobook version of Inventing Bitcoin, go to swanbitcoin.com slash free book. All Swan asks is that you pay it forward, share it with at least three family and friends. And if you join the Swan force at swanbitcoin.com slash enlist, you'll get a special link to the free copy of Inventing Bitcoin that will help you recruit new Bitcoiners. You can share the book with anyone, and if they eventually start stacking with Swan, you will get credit for that referral. Spread Bitcoin knowledge and Swan Bitcoin, the best and safest way to start accumulating Bitcoin. Go to swanbitcoin.com slash free book. Unchained Capital is building Bitcoin native financial services on a foundation of multi-signature. Their multi-sig vaults are designed for ultra-secure long-term storage and there's no setup or storage fees if you build it on your own. Now, if you want the white glove treatment, their team will teach you all about multi-signature, ship you two hardware wallets and answer all your questions and deposit $1,000 of Bitcoin in your vault through their concierge service. You can also buy Bitcoin through their OTC desk for purchases $50,000 or higher straight into your new vault, which is great for self-directed Bitcoin retirement accounts and for companies moving Bitcoin to Treasury. Their advanced business accounts, OTC desk and concierge service can also help move your corporate Treasury to Bitcoin where your team controls the private keys. Check them out and enter code LEVERA when ordering a concierge onboarding service to get $50 off. Go to unchained-capital.com. November 27th is coming up. Go and check out BitcoinBlackFriday.com. This is a project from my friends over at the Bitcoin Magazine and also behind the Bitcoin 2021 conference. It's a celebration of the growing Bitcoin economy. On the site, you can find active deals up to 50% off on your favorite Bitcoin gear and other merchants that accept BTC. It doesn't stop with spending Bitcoins, though. The Fold team has teamed up with Bitcoin Black Friday to bring you a special promo for the much-awaited Bitcoin back card. Spend fiat and earn Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Now, if you sign up for early access for the Fold card on Bitcoin Black Friday, you will be entered into a raffle to win a whole Bitcoin. That's right. Go to BitcoinBlackFriday.com right now. Sign up for the Fold Bitcoin Rewards card to enter and get a chance to win an entire Bitcoin. Hong, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Stefan. So Hong, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I know you had a career uh, before all this Bitcoin stuff. Yeah, I, uh, I've spent 10 years in Wall Street. Uh, working as an investment banker at Goldman um, within financial institutions and fintech. Um, And then after that, I uh, I switched on to the investment side, uh, mostly doing growth equity investment. Um, And it was during that investment uh, life when I came across OKCoin um, and kind of uh, started to uh, really seriously take a look at it and then fall in love with uh, with Bitcoin and everything related to crypto. Um, so that's really how the whole journey started. So when you first heard of Bitcoin, were you like most of us, you disregarded it? Like, what was your experience like? Yeah, I, I first heard about Bitcoin in 2000 and I think thir- uh, 12 or 13 when I was at Goldman. Uh, there was this, uh, there was an MD um, on the structure finance side who was really brilliant. Uh, his, uh, his Jewish um, and uh she talked about Bitcoin and you know how how brilliant Bitcoin uh, is and and the price you know is 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 going to go up. I I totally disregard. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, with, with everything going on, I was you know I was not even having a life as an investment banker, so <laughs> didn't even have an opportunity to to really dig into it. Um, but but uh, but then in 2016, uh, when I was uh, uh, talking to uh, star and and uh, the team looking at okay coin and the business i started to really look at uh, uh bitcoin and what it is about and i realized that it is a is a it's an innovation it's a um it's an experiment it's a marvelous experiment and it's beautiful um and back then it was a lot of speculation uh trading uh going on within crypto within bitcoin and uh, actually a lot of the uh trading volume came from china and and from an investment perspective, you know, I was 
also debating uh, whether it makes sense to do the investment. Uh, if it is a speculative trading, does it last? Right? Will it last? Or will it just go away? And ultimately, I think what um, helped me make the decision is the uh, is the conviction I found in, in Bitcoin. I think that it you know uh, back then it is a lot of uh, it was driven by a lot of speculation, but I think ultimately there's a beauty in it that sometime down the road, people more and more people will realize that Bitcoin is here to stay. And also, I think the thinking in the space, uh, there were some people who are writing from a very you know intelligent perspective, even in you know, 2012 and 2013 in those days. Uh, but I would say, at least in my experience, a lot of the people who were around in 2016 were, it was just kind of seen like a gambling toy sort of thing. And I think in, re- in more recent years, we've started to see more of a mature understanding around you know, sound money and things like that. So at what point did some of those aspects of the story come to you? It was really around 16 and 17. Um, because I think it, it's hard, right? Because uh, we grew up, um, the we grew up in an environment where we, you know, if we go to school, uh, learn about economics, uh, about finance. And also, you know, for me, I I went to Chicago for business school and then later on joined Goldman on the investment banking side. Um, a lot of the um, driving forces is my belief in, in free markets. Um, but it was ironical that it was not until I left Goldman and, and then I realized, okay, actually the free market that we're seeing today is actually not totally free because the the market um while well, the prices we're seeing is reflected in you know usd in, in money whatever whatever other fiat currency that we have and that fiat currency is not free it's it's actually uh you know a central planning <laughs> uh but that was generally in, that's generally invisible to every one of us and it's uh, it's taken for granted and also the inflation concept is also taken for granted that the concept that inflation a moderate and controlled inflation is good for economy is taken for granted um, with all the uh, uh, economic training training that we receive. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's really hard, right, to tra- challenge that assumption and challenge that money is probably something that doesn't have to be created by government uh, because ultimately what uh, creates money is the trust, is, is people's trust that this is something that can actually hold value over time across different spaces and and over um, uh, in in different scale, um, and and historically uh, that money format does not come in a format of a government backed um, uh, paper. Uh, it was only very recent that we see a uh, large scale of uh, money printing by government that's not actually linked to, to gold or any other uh, physical uh, thing that has a actual uh, supply um, that is somehow limited. Um, so, so I think challenging that assumption is really hard. Um, so it, it, it naturally takes some time, and and I think it makes sense that um, you know Bitcoin was created in two thousand eight, two thousand nine during that crisis, uh, financial crisis uh, period, um, and then the the first wave of uh, almost like institutional uh, endorsement and kind of semi mainstream momentum also. Uh, you know, does not occur until 2020 when we see that money printing again at large scale. Um, so I think that that is really what's going on. Uh, people start to see what's going on with with the the fiat system, with the current financial system, and then when they see Bitcoin over the last um, you know 10, 11, 12 years, when everybody was saying Bitcoin is going to die, it's it's just a speculative trading uh, vehicle, and it it's just you know, stay around, and and there are a lot of price volatilities. But it, you know, it went down and go up again. And there's a st- steady trend line of going up, and there's also a steady improvement in the underlying protocol level um, uh, that is really pushing, continue, that's continuously pushing Bitcoin toward that goal of being a a reliable, uh, secure, and and scarce uh, 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 store of value. Um, and that ultimately can become that uh, global money. I think that um, that takes time, but I think that ultimately will play out in a free market. When you speak to other people who came from the banking world, 
oftentimes they're they're stuck in a certain way of thinking, right? So they're thinking, oh, the world needs inflation, or or they're thinking it's just natural and it's just a it's just like this kind of phenomenon that just happens, and they're not assessing. Well, hang on, exactly why is that happening? What was it that led to you kind of challenging that? view and was it just a was it just a matter of being exposed to the right resources or reading the bitcoin standard or things like that um i think it also takes a little bit of reflection um you know i joined banking in 2008 which was the probably the most volatile uh uh timing to to join investment banking and and i literally you know sat there with uh, seeing my uh, a lot of uh, quote unquote classmates in my class at Goldman um, who uh, are you know either uh, let go or move around, um, and and some of my other classmates at, at Chicago they went to you know uh, Bear Stearns and Lehman Brother uh, or and some of the other investment banks and their jobs just went went out of the window uh, overnight. Um, but that was only just on the investment banking side, right? Um, there is a lot, a larger story out there, um, and and you see uh, all the uh, distress throughout the financial system. And I worked on many different deals, spinoffs, um, you know, M and A transactions, go, go, you know, IPOs, secondary offerings, warrant offerings, and particularly around two thousand eight, two thousand nine, uh, and two thousand ten. Uh, there was a lot of banks who were undercapitalized, and and then a lot of bad assets come uh, that came out of the uh, uh, securization, um, and uh, you know banks were just undercapitalized, and then there was a lot of uh, government coming out to to save those uh, banks that cannot fail, uh, to save Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, um, and put money, put taxpayers' money out there to to save them. Um, at, at that point, I think it was quite confusing and, you know, something was wrong, uh, but I couldn't really tell what was really wrong. Obviously, there was liquidity crisis, but what it really is going on, it was kind of a little bit hard to um, unpack. Uh, but I think over time and particularly after I, you know, um, dive into what Bitcoin is about, I, it occurred to me that actually, what was going on back then is because the the system was built on top of a, a quote unquote uh, inflation first system, and you just print money. So basically, back in two thousand eight, when we had that situation, it was not because totally just a liquidity issue, right? It is actually also a solvency issue, um, and the roots of the um, issue also went back to two thousand um, the, the the internet bubble, and to to quote unquote, save the economy, uh, dig, dig the economy out of that hole, uh, the, the government led by Greenspan, the Fed uh, led by Greenspan, ended up printing a lot of money. Um, so that kind of seemed to solve the problem, but actually planted a uh, seed for larger problems later on. And I think we're kind of in that cycle <laughs> again. Mm. Um, um, and it, it's just hard to see how we can actually get out of it uh, in the current setting um, without fixing the money itself um, because the government will continue to print and and when there is a, a solvency issue plus liquidity issue and when you have the government printing money that money printing activity uh, is is almost just a money uh, wealth transfer activity right so basically those with um, financial um, uh, resources, they have the capability to wait for that investment opportunity when there's a lot of uh, distress in the market. They have free money sitting aside and they can grab um, cheap assets that where the risks are b- borne by the government, by the taxpayer money. But those who are the middle classes, who are, who are lower, you know, uh, struggling uh, day in and day out for their everyday life, they don't really have any uh, way to to get out of it, um, and 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 you know we this year we see the uh, all the global uncertainty brought about by the the pandemic. Um, we we all know that something is wrong. The society is, you know is undergoing a lot of distress. Econom economy is not doing well. But then we see all the confusing uh, signals, economic signals where. 
you know, it seems like the, the equity market is going up all time high. Um, so I think those does reflect um, what we currently have in the financial system, where when the, the government print money, those money goes not doesn't go flow into the real economy. It doesn't really flow to where it should flow through, right? It, it goes to the, the capital markets and the financial assets um, uh, form bubble, which is, you know, it, it is what it is because that's, that's, you know, that's what human nature is about. You know, human people, when, when you have financial resources, you, you seek to maximize those. Uh, that's what market is about. And, and I don't think we should blame market for it because that's what market is about. That's what human nature is about. Uh, but but it's really because the incentive uh, that's built into the system that's not directing the resources to the right place. The price is not giving us the right signal. The price we're seeing is not the real price. It is uh, it is the nominal price. It's not the real price. Um, it's without the the real price reflecting the real you know demand and supply, and and when you have all the the return uh, uh, being maximal in the capital markets where people can just put money into the equity market. And then, you know, uh, when the the price go up to the certain level, you take the chips off the table and the bubble burst and the, the, um, the rest of the, the market uh, hurt. It is, that's, that's what the system is built for. And, and again, you will see like for this cycle, again, you, we see, uh, banks coming out with very low interest rate. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, real estate buying activities, uh, uh, mortgage, you know, take, take, people taking on loans. That's, again, encouraged by the inflation uh, 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 assumption in the monetary system. Um, and and the, the system rewards uh, debt take, takers, doesn't reward uh, savers. Uh, but but there is, you know, there's always a rainy day when the economy uh, really suffers and people start to uh, uh, see the divergence between the equity market and the, the labor market, sometime at some point the, the music will stop. And when everything crumbles down, you know, the banks who are you know, putting out loans out there may suffer again. People who are putting their hard earned money into equity market, um, you know, which ended up being a bubble will suffer again. So it's just a vicious circle. Um, so again, you know, it's it's not a. Uh, I, I don't think it's any kind of uh, one uh, single moment that kind of bring light to it, but but it does uh, take time for me to realize that actually uh, it is the system itself uh, that that need to be fixed, uh, uh, and Bitcoin represents a a, a very unique opportunity um, as a potential solution to that. Um, but but again, I'm I'm not. I don't think you know it is an easy path forward because there's a lot of um, uh, there are a lot of uh, cultural and and political uh, elements in it, but I think uh, this is actually the first time in human society that we see a a digital and um, and sound money uh, that is global uh, that is you know verifiable and censorship resistant resistant that can actually grow into a, a global reserve currency. I think that is really beautiful. Um, you know, time will tell, but but uh, but I think as 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 time passes, as more and more people start to uh, uh, ask question our own assumptions and and look at what Bitcoin potentially can present, I think that chance of Bitcoin emerging as a uh, more superior sound money can can really grow. So uh, as Bitcoin moves through these phases, as people talk about, right, collectible and so on, uh, where do you see Bitcoin right now in terms of uh, its current development? And what kinds of, um, I guess, upside do you see over the next year or so? Uh, I'm happy to talk about it, but I will just caveat by saying that this is just my personal take, because uh, I think there is no science in saying, you know, uh, exactly where Bitcoin is um, because we are in, in today's environment. It's, it's hard for us to look into the crystal ball and see how the future actually will evolve. Uh, but my personal take is that um, Bitcoin has come um, to the point where it, it has passed its first collectible phase. 
uh, where you know only a small uh, a group of people really believe in it as future sound money, but most of the demand are speculative trading demand. I think right now um, we are at, at this a phase where more and more people start to actually realize that Bitcoin can be a solid and superior store of value. More and more people start to uh, want to put some of their money into it as a hedging uh, uh, tool and hold for longer term. Um, and this is when I think we start to see a lot more uh, thoughtful adoption happens, both on the institutional side as well as on the uh, retail side. I'm actually more. I, there's. A, I think I know that there's a lot of excitement in an industry about institutional development and institutional adoption, which I think is going to be critical and important uh, for the continued growth of Bitcoin. But I also believe that um, it is going to be the retail side of the adoption is go, has been what's been driving Bitcoin's growth and will continue to uh, be an important uh, factor um, in its evolution and should be an important factor as in its evolution. Um, when when I think about um, the Bitcoin itself, um, the the reason I'm thinking of it as this in kind of coming into the second phase, there are two folds. Uh, one obviously is all the uh, institutional endorsement that we're starting to see, particularly in this year. Right, um, there are so many names out there that kind of start to uh, uh, collect uh, uh, mainstream attention, uh, uh, focus mainstream attention on Bitcoin. We see uh, the OCC allowing U.S. banks to offer crypto asset custody earlier this year. Um, we've got um, a lot of the heavyweights uh, in the public company uh, domain, like Square and MicroStrategy, officially allocating their treasury cash into Bitcoin. Uh, we see PayPal coming up, uh, allowing uh, Americans buy and, and sell crypto uh, on directly on their app. Although I personally, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, would want to see more out of them instead of uh, what they're currently offering, but we'll see. I, I'm, I'm sure things will evolve. And also Fidelity has always been bullish on Bitcoin and, and they come out with you know a 5% allocation case recently too. That, that less continues. So I think that's one side of it. And a lot of the Wall Street investors, hedge fund um, heavyweights, uh, they seriously look at it and, and start to kind of really uh, support uh, the idea of Bitcoin as a long-term uh, inflation hedging tool. I think the other side of the story, uh, again, coming back from to, to, to my investment uh, roots, is that when I think about investment, uh, it's always important to go back to the foundational question of what it is, right? What, what it is for um, is where are the fundamentals? How strong are the fundamentals? Is it um, something that can ultimately bring value to the table. Uh, utility, by value, I mean utility, uh, uh, versus just some potential short-term speculation. I think from that perspective, you know, uh, uh, that's also why we, um, at OKCoin, we have been recently doing a lot of uh, 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 developer grant, uh, supporting uh, Bitcoin developer community. Um, that, that's really the reason why I think uh, it's it's you know um, it's a a very encouraging thing to see over the last few years on the developer side because um, the developer community has hasn't been as visible uh, to the larger audience as say Bitcoin price or other crypto asset price. However, that is um, that is really what um, you know has has anchored the the uh, healthiness um, and visibility of Bitcoin as a future sound money, right? Without because Bitcoin ultimately the network is a open source network. It's a software. It's an open source software. It's digital, um, and for this, and it's not a uh, it's not a, a debt. Uh, thing. It's a living thing. It, and it's a continuously evolving thing. It's a continuously evolving creature. Uh, for, for the network to continue to, to evolve, to grow, you actually need 
developers to take care of it. Um, and I think um, in, the, in Bitcoin's first, uh, say, 10 years, um, it, it, there are still a lot of kind of uh, debates uh, within the community about, you know, for example, particularly around 2017, where Bitcoin uh, uh, should go, um, how, um, how to make it, is it a, a sound, mon- uh, sound money? Is it a payment? Uh, what's the right next step? Um, so that's when we see um, the, the, a lot of the um, controversy within the community, right? We see the BCH uh, and BSV uh, coming, um, uh, hard forking out of uh, uh, B- BTC. Um, but, but we've been past that and, and we've been able to see uh, 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 three successful halvings um, since inception. Um, the third one being the one that happened this year. Which is which is great with all, everything else uncertain going on. This is actually something certain, and uh, it, it happened as predicted, uh, which is again beautiful. Um, and and also there are a lot of uh, uh, development um, uh, level protocol level progress that has been uh, happening steadily um, over these these years. One uh, some of some of those that are I think uh, uh, most uh, interesting and um, uh, critical are the merge of Signet and the Schnorr and Taproot, and also um, the increased focus on fuzz testing. All of these are really designed to enhance the, the privacy and the scalability of the network, which is, again, crucial to the, uh, the characteristics of Bitcoin as a, a store of value, as, as a, uh, a potential future uh, reserve currency. So, so I think it's really down to whether we have a healthy um, uh, developer community that that continue to work on the the underlying protocol, continue to develop um, the protocol, and continue to 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 quote unquote nurture and guide um, the network to in the right direction. Um, so I think you know, with with everything we see in in the developer community, what's happening on the protocol level, what's happening on the at the application level, and also uh, in twenty twenty, we've seen uh, not just us coming out to support the sponsors on a no stream uh, uh, basis, but also a lot a uh, lot more other uh, uh, parties and institutions coming out to support it. Which is again great. Uh, great. It gave a, gave me personally a lot of confidence in uh, keeping this uh, uh, live creature, you know, live and and steady. Um, and you know, the the Bitcoin as the fundamental layer of money, it has to have be in very steady hands. And and I think we are right now um, going in the right direction. Um, so that's really why, um, you know, I feel like we are in the second phase where, and it's still still early stage because the, the, the mainstream adoption is just getting started. We haven't even, uh, you know, I think there people must have seen a lot of the Google trend charts uh, floating out there. We haven't even get started on the retail side. Uh, but, but I think we're, we're starting to, to, to head in that direction. Uh, there's still a long way to go. And uh, the developer uh, community also need to continue to to need a lot of uh, support from from the uh, ecosystem to keep it um, decentralized and 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 also um, uh, independent. I think those are really important. Uh, but but I think we are going in the right direction. Back to the show in a moment. A word for the sponsors of the show. Hodl Hodl is a peer-to-peer exchange and they've got a new lending platform. It's global, non-custodial, anonymous, and using Bitcoin multi-sig. Check out my recent episode with Max Caden where we talk about it. It's a fascinating new product allowing peer-to-peer lending and borrowing between users. Your Bitcoin is locked up in multi-sig escrow and that loan is funded using a stablecoin such as USDT. And if you're a hodler who wants some liquidity without selling your Bitcoin, this is now another option to get fiat stablecoin liquidity. Or, if you've got stablecoins and you want interest, this is Bitcoin DeFi. With Hoddle Hoddle's Lend platform, you set your own terms and you put up offers depending on how long you want to borrow, the interest rates, 
go and check it out at lend.hodlhodl.com. And finally, Knox is a Bitcoin custodian dedicated to ensuring their insurance protection covers the full value of their customers' assets. For example, suppose a fiduciary wants to hold $250 million of Bitcoin with Knox. Knox will seek to obtain $250 million of insurance dedicated exclusively to that account and adjustable to volatility. No fractional coverage or narrow scope. Insurance for what it's worth, a tool to transfer risk. If you are a Bitcoin company, investment fund, trust, or family office, check out Knox for your insured customers. Custody, noxcustody.com. On the developer grant program, can you tell us a little bit about what your focuses are and what sort of things are you interested to see uh, to sponsor? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, the way we think about our sponsorship, um, there are a lot of different ways to provide sponsorship to uh, developers. Uh, the reason we started with independent grant uh, um, to developers is that uh, we think that those are most direct. Um, they're probably not scalable because it's very much uh, developer-based or project-based, but we think it's very direct. And, we, and it's also an easier way to keep it independent and decentralized. Um, when we think about... Um, grant recipients and how uh, we allocate those resources, we're looking really looking at um, uh, basically three main areas for our quote-unquote long-term investment. Um, the first one is, again, around the protocol level. We want to really see uh, the developers who are passionate about and also have shown track record in working on the um, uh, Bitcoin Core uh, protocol to improve security, to improve privacy, um, and also um, so that that's really the the number one um, investment area that we're looking at. Uh, number two is about adoption. Um, uh, from from where I'm looking at right now, I think the first the second phase as an investment as the store of value. Um, the payment side of things is not going to be uh, uh, um, as widespread as we would like. What we would like, and if we have to choose again, this is my personal perspective. We have to choose for Bitcoin uh, to function as a uh, store of value versus as a medium of payment, um, a medium of exchange, or as a payment. I probably choose the former versus the latter. Um, if if I have to give and take. However, I think over time, it will be uh, very important and helpful to make sure that there is that utility side of Bitcoin, not just as a store of value, but also can be used as a payment uh, in the reality, in real life, to buy and sell. Um, so I, th I think any projects um, uh, that can help create, increase that, that payment and adoption of Bitcoin is uh, what well, we are interested in. Uh, support supporting, and that's where BTC Pay comes in. And I think the third area that we're we're uh, particularly interested in, uh, particularly after spending a year uh, working with the developer community, is to figure out how we can better support the developer ecosystem, i.e., um, help uh, uh, onboarding new developers. Raising awareness uh, in in the importance of uh, a Bitcoin core developer uh, community, and also testing frameworks uh, because testing uh, review and testing has been uh, one of the uh, uh, bottleneck uh, in Bitcoin core development. Um, not as high profile and as uh, visible again as the Bitcoin price fluctuation, but I think it's actually pretty critical. So these three areas are where we have been really focused on. And if you look at how um, the, the, the four recipients that we've got so far, um, all of them actually are pretty strong in uh, either you know, two or, or three of these uh, areas. And uh, they, they're all pretty big on uh, providing that mentorship and, and onboarding support um, to new developers they either work on privacy or security uh, and or uh, working on improving the testing uh, 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 bottleneck. 
And the BTC pay again is around the adoption uh, side of things. So when it comes to doing the developer grants program, uh, if if you aren't a developer yourself, sometimes it can be difficult to know who you know who's good and who's not who's you know who's a charlatan and who's actually genuinely a good developer or doing some interesting and valuable projects and, and work in the space. So can you share some insight into how you select developers and projects to support there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it it is where we need help from other people <laughs> to to be totally upfront, um, and and that's also where we are happy to share uh, what we've learned with um, other exchanges who uh, who are exploring um, uh, the possibility of being a participant as well. Um, so we we have got a lot of help from you know people like Steve, uh, like John. Um, basically, you know, they, sometime they came across candidates, uh, they would refer those candidates to us. Um, they would, um, help us understand, uh, what those developers do, uh, why their work is relevant, uh, how relevant, um, uh, it is. Um, and they would also, uh, uh, make introduction, um, uh, to other uh, people in the industry who can help us, uh, who can give us perspectives on on that level of uh, re- relevance, uh, and and how that fit into our developer program. So we've got a lot of help, uh, just in 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 short terms. Uh, we've got a lot of help from the community in evaluating that. That's also why initially I was when I was talking about how we approach this uh, our program is. You know, we, we, we do it in the in a format of uh, uh, independent developer grant, I grant uh, uh, provided to individuals, uh, individual developers or individual projects. Um, it is direct, but it's not scalable because there's definitely a, 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 a pretty big threshold um, entry of Barry, if you will, in terms of knowledge. Uh, to be able to uh, assess, you know, quote unquote, who who deserve it doesn't mean that you know, those who haven't got our grant doesn't deserve it. It's just how some of the parameters um, of the of the the grants uh, uh, recipients or prospects fit into our program. But there is definitely a lot of the soft qualities and you know uh, conversation uh, and and evaluation going on. And without help from all these um, friends and, and community uh, participants, we wouldn't have been able to do it. And also, I think that's also why, for example, if you look at uh, what Coinbase recently announced that they are trying to do something similar, they have assembled a advisor board, I believe, uh, who uh, the members of, uh, of that board basically are uh, developers uh, themselves, uh, so they would be able to to provide their perspectives on what makes sense um, for the long term development of Bitcoin from their own perspective, and then uh, uh, the decision is up to them or up to us, right? So, so that, that format is you know it's not scalable, but it's you know it's probably more direct than other. Yeah, I see. Yeah, and uh, yeah, acknowledging that it's not necessarily the most super scalable approach. Also, I presume you're also considering, well, when we fund a, a developer or a certain project, is it tied to a certain outcome or is it more like, you know, we want you to do some testing and review and we're, we're, like, how, how do you sort of assess uh, what's, you know, whether that developer is actually doing what you've asked them and that kind of thing? Yeah, we don't ask the developers to do anything. <laughs> we we uh, we don't ask them to do anything uh, uh, that's kind of tied to the to the grant itself. Um, we would ask what they do, what they have done before making our decision to see whether um, whether the the their passion and their work is, are in line with how we want to structure our program. Uh, but but once granted, our grant is totally no uh, uh, no string attached. Um, we pick our developers because um, uh, on a couple of kind of uh, uh, I would say very soft uh, standards. Uh, again, we uh, we go with recipients who are 
very articulated and have a very demonstrated vision for advancing the ecosystem. Uh, we, we like uh, um, developers who are very passionate uh, about what they're doing, share the, the, the vision that we have about Bitcoin. Um, it's, again, free of obligation, so they can go ahead and do whatever they want. Uh, and it's not exclusive either. If they feel like they need other uh, support, they can go ahead and get that. Um, and uh, um, the same thing goes for project-based uh, BTC Pay as well. We, we, we never really tell them, hey, this is what we want you to work on. They work on whatever they want to work on. Um, um, and that assessment happens before the grant is, is, uh, is given. Basically, if we feel like there is an alignment in, in mission and passion, of um of the recipient and what we are looking for, we we are happy to to do it because ultimately, you know, we believe that uh Bitcoin fund uh, developer funding should continue to be diversified, should continue to be uh, to be de- independent and give developers a lot of option. And ideally, we can provide a um, lifetime career path for developers, for particularly uh, high quality developers to join. Uh, and, and contribute uh, to build Bitcoin uh, network. However, ultimately, I think you know the in line with the open source ethos, um, it has to be the passion and personal conviction that drive the, the decision on the developer side. It's not. It has. It doesn't. It shouldn't be anything related to the monetary incentive. Monetary incentive is only there to remove the. The uncertainty, <laughs> uh, um, but but it shouldn't be that incentive. So we don't uh, intend to to be that economic incentive uh, binding in whatever sense. I see. Yeah, and uh, it's an interesting thing in the space because, well, just about with anything, you need uh, you have to be able to present or get some level of attention on what you're doing, and there needs to be value seen in what you're doing. And so, what I have seen in practice is. People start doing something for free, and then if there's enough people who value it, then someone might fund you for that. And so that's maybe in practice what happens with uh, some developers as well. If they're working on a certain project or a certain piece of software or a certain project that really uh, is seen as like a high value project, well, then that's where uh, there's more of a. It's easier to make a case there for that person to get sponsored uh, to continue doing that work and to keep that project running. Also. Wondering, in terms of, you mentioned earlier that uh, the individual grant funding model may not be as scalable. So does that mean potentially in future you would look for other ways to try to achieve the developer funding grants program or what are you thinking there? Yeah, we're definitely reflecting upon that and and, and trying to explore uh, different ways to, to make it more scalable. Uh, we haven't uh, we haven't got to the point where we got tangible action points there yet. Um, if we do, we uh, will definitely let you know and let the community know. Um, but we are exploring ways where uh, we can provide a more scalable, ongoing support to to uh, both uh, raise awareness and also uh help uh, uh onboarding new developers uh make it easier to to onboarding new developers and nurture new developers uh but but you know it, it's a very it's a very difficult it's a very difficult um task <laughs> to be honest yeah. yeah um i don't i we don't presume that we can do it ourselves by ourselves i think it probably takes industry wide efforts to um, try different things and see what works uh, because we you know on the one hand we want to make it scalable but on the other hand I think we don't want to have any central point of failure um, and we don't want to uh, um, distort uh, the the um, you know take away the the, the, the fun of the, the fun of working for for Bitcoin itself from the developers. Um, so I think it has to be carefully designed, yeah. And uh, I guess, yeah, there's probably different ways it could be done. As one example, you might need someone on staff at, you know, at OKCoin who can assess contributions themselves and then guide you in terms of, oh, okay, I think this is a good project to fund and that kind of thing. Or otherwise you are, 
I guess, reliant on, um, you know, uh, calling on other individuals in the space, people like Steve Lee and John Newbery, as you mentioned, uh, to sort of give you some sort of a steer there. Yeah, d- that's definitely also uh, on our roadmap. Uh, we, we would like to at some point have some in-house capability as well to 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 uh, help with that assessment. Um, we'll continue to evolve our developer program and our practice as well um, as as our uh, you know understanding of the the space uh, continue to evolve. Um, but but again, I think the uh, the the goal is really to make sure that we are investing in this space long term. And we hope that uh, other participants uh, also see the importance of this and also uh, invest in it. Because particularly when the the adoption of Bitcoin continues to grow, it, it will be increasingly important to make sure that the underlying network uh, is sound and safe and private and, and scalable. Um, and that won't happen by itself. <laughs> it takes... Uh, yeah takes a lot of efforts actually um so so yeah i think it's a very important thing for the whole industry of course yeah and uh, definitely i'm very happy to see that and uh i think uh, many of my listeners uh like to see uh bitcoin uh exchanges and companies supporting bitcoin development and technology that is you know bitcoin adjacent let's say um so are are there any other kind of areas where you think you'd like to see uh you know, further development happen? I mean, uh, things like lightning or perhaps things like in relation to Bitcoin mining infrastructure or um, maybe or maybe another example would be stuff like uh, some of these more infrastructure sort of things like Blockstream Satellite and uh, some of these ideas around ways that people can transact in in under more adversarial circumstances. You know, maybe an example there might be mesh networking Um yeah, yeah. Or, or perhaps around security. Uh, are, are there any other kind of focus areas that are that come to your mind? Yeah. Uh, look, I'm I don't have an engineering background, so I feel like I'm getting out of my comfort zone as sure, I get sure. into the technical side of things. Uh, but but Lightning is definitely something that we have been uh, uh, following closely. I think it will be a very interesting. Uh, it, it's not. It it's been steadily growing uh, i think the ecosystem has been steadily growing the the size of it is, is still very small the size of transaction that happen uh, uh, at the second layer is still very small um, but i think as the adoption uh, uh, grows um, uh, for bitcoin as the transaction volume overall at the network continue to grow at bitcoin i think at some point we may start to see a turning point uh, for second layer solutions like Lightning, um, because you know people will will you know the people will need uh, faster payments um, of Bitcoin, smaller amount Bitcoin, uh, right? The the larger amount Bitcoin can happen on the first layer, uh, like what we see today in the traditional financial market with wire transfer, it takes longer. It's it's a little bit more expensive, but some of the Everyday transactions has has to happen uh, with uh, uh, faster speed and uh, less costly. Um, so I think I think there will be a, a turning point when we get to a critical mass um, down there. So so that is uh, an area that we we have and will continue to follow. Uh, definitely mining. I know that um, uh, Steve uh, and his team have been working closely uh, on that front. Uh, we've talked about uh, uh, supporting developers on that front as well. Um, uh, that's on our radar. We just haven't got to got to it yet. Um, but but we will continue to 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 follow that and 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 support as we see fit and as our own resources allow. Um, we will also step in there and, and help. Uh, um, and, and and I think generally you know, raising awareness, uh, working with the developer community to discuss some of those and, and also, you know, uh, uh, bring the, a larger audience uh, to the space is going to be helpful and interesting. Um, ultimately, we cannot bank on a handful of uh, entities, uh, corporate entities to, to provide that financial support. I think ultimately, if we can build a, a larger, wider base uh, for 
uh, providing that type of economic incentive um, is going to be uh, longer term healthy. Right, and as I'm sure you're, you've probably seen, and uh, you know, I think many people in the space comment on this as well. It's just basically everything in this space is indexed to the price, right? So as number go up, we see you know more exchange signups, more wallet downloads, more podcast downloads, more developers, more projects, more everything, right? Um, so I think that is um, perhaps one way where as number goes up, we start to see more people interested to fund different development projects and things um actually another interesting point that might be worthwhile is around political risks uh Mm -hmm. i know in one of the pieces you wrote uh just recently you you touched on this idea of political risk what kinds of political risks do you see with bitcoin um obviously you know with bitcoin being positioned as future money there's always the possibility that the sovereign governments um can come out and ban it uh, because that threatened fiat currency and potentially can take away the ability of the governments to um, basically, quote unquote, tax um, without taxing. Um, But I I think those risks are high in probably certain areas and also in earlier years. Uh, But as the Bitcoin continue to build uh, its momentum of adoption, the a uh, uh, worldwide ban is going to be harder and harder, and it actually has never been. Uh, um, it, it we have never really seen a world world uh, worldwide ban, and, and and I I think it's probably not doable either, just because there is no uh, there is no one single global government. If we have one single global government who has vision enough vision to see the future threat of Bitcoin and just kill it in the first, you know, maybe 10 or seven or eight years, then, you know, probably the game was over. Uh, But there were, luckily there was no one global government. There are so many governments out there. Some governments um, maybe feel the threat earlier than others and will ban them either uh, in full sim or partially. And that has already happened with several, uh, in several cases. Uh, but as long as there are areas where Bitcoin is allowed, um, you know, human nature will 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 play the card. Uh, Bitcoin represents human nature, and and it brings better uh, store of value to people. It, it brings uh, wealth preservation to people, and with the the right sound uh, money system, actually, uh, that can encourage saving. It can a lot of good things can happen, right? The uh, the market can, can actually function well in the future. So in a, in a, I think, I think over time, um, we will always have that political risk here and there in pockets, uh, where, you know, the threat to Bitcoin will exist, but there's no way I don't see the risk of Bitcoin being banned out of existence today. I don't, I just don't think that it's realistic. Um, um, that being said, I do think that there is still risk in, uh, uh, because banning uh, Bitcoin have two layers. The one is the banning of Bitcoin as a store of value, as an investment vehicle. Uh, the second is the banning of Bitcoin as a payment uh, method, as as a u- payment utility. I think the the second risk is still uh, there. Uh, I don't think that is completely out of the window, uh, particularly because the um, there will be a pretty long runway where the fiat currencies uh, will coexist with Bitcoin. And I don't think that adoption of Bitcoin as the single payment uh, currency will happen anytime soon. So uh, in, in that window, um, you know, there's always a chance that uh, the government can allow Bitcoin as a investment vehicle, but does not allow it or put very strict uh, requirements um, on Bitcoin being used as a payment medium, uh, a medium of exchange. So I think that risk still exists, um, but but I think over time, that risk will also uh, uh, be reduced over time. Um, time. Time shall tell, but I think that 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 level of volatility will uh, will always uh, will always be around with us. Um, that's just uh, I think that's probably part of Bitcoin as a experiment and as a uh, 
quote unquote movement, um, and what that means. You know, it, it's basically challenging the status quo, and that status quo, unfortunately, is government. Right, and uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I think uh, the chances of a of an outright worldwide ban are vanishingly slim. Uh, but maybe a, a more likely or possible scenario is one where it, it sort of gets captured, and uh, you know, th- maybe things. So some of these ideas are more like speculation or what's or what's possible, but you know there there there's chatter about self custody eventually being banned, and I think that kind of thing is a is an interesting vector to consider, and it, perhaps it also highlights the importance of having open source software and tooling as well. Uh, what's your view on that? I think that will be really hard. I mean, there have been a period when in the U.S. there was a ban on. Uh holding gold uh, as an individual. Uh, was that ban yeah. successful? Obviously not. Government ban on uh, holding guns or you know some of the other stuff. Um, and it never has been successful um, as a whole. It may be successful in pockets of areas, but you know, there are always um, ways for people to, to figure out how to actually <laughs> go around it. Um, so yeah, I think it would be really hard, um, you know, uh, particularly when it comes to self custody. It, it, you know, it's, uh, um, Bitcoin is censorship resistant. Um, as long as uh, uh, as long as the there there is that level of uh, a global network that's still out there, um, it, it's really hard for the government to make an effective ban on self custody without seeing large flee of capital. Uh, because people vote with their money, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so, so ultimately, I think that that economy, uh, economic power, human nature will speak for itself. Um, so, so, I think time is our friend. Um, time is uh, time is the friend to Bitcoin, um, and and as long as there is sound development, uh, steady development at the protocol level, and the industry work together to really promote. Uh, long-term adoption, um, and and um, I think yeah, I think we're we're going to 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 go in the right direction. There's always obviously, uh, it's it's hard to tell uh, when that ultimate uh, uh, situation will uh, will happen. I think that's a million-dollar question, but I, I think I think at some point we'll we will see uh, a, a glimpse of it, hopefully. Um, but I think short term it will be interesting to see how the uh, this current institutional uh, wave of adoption will affect Bitcoin short term. Uh, as we've seen recently, the price is going up. As you mentioned, Stefan, I think the Bitcoin's price volatility itself is a great self marketing tool. As the Bitcoin price continue to go up uh, and 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 you know pull back, obviously from time to time, but have a upward trend uh, over time. Uh, there will be a lot more newcomers uh, starting to notice it and, and starting to look into what it is about. Um, you know, it's started starting as a speculative trading or maybe just, you know, give it a try kind of investment um, mentality. But over time, if they really think about what it is about, um, you know, hopefully there's a chance of a conversion. So what do you think uh, the next few years offers us in terms of uh, people coming to understand the significance of Bitcoin? What sorts of, um, I guess, narratives and uh, messaging do you think will resonate with the people coming in over the next few years? Um, I think Bitcoin really represents human nature, right? It, it give, empowers people. It empowers individuals. It gives the... Uh, the money back to people. Uh, um, I think that's going to be really powerful. The the internet that waves that we've seen over the last uh, two decades has always been uh, how we are using technology, using the internet to empower individuals, uh, starting from commas, from information sharing, from uh, uh, how we live our social lives, uh, going to media. Uh, we, we've seen how that changed the music industry. We've seen how that changed the, the social uh, community, recent uh, rise of TikTok. All these, and, and also a lot of more people uh, 
like yourself, having your own podcast, um, that hasn't really been possible before. But with today's internet tools, individuals are empowered to be their own uh, entrepreneur. Um, but the the previous tools of internet uh, can enable P two P transfer of information, but what it doesn't, what it cannot do is that P2P transfer of value. And I think Bitcoin is that enablement, the P2P transfer of value. And when you combine the P2P transfer of information with the P2P transfer of money, uh, of value, that's also where for the first time in a human society, we can actually see a possibility of us building a digital life um, that we actually control ourselves. We can actually control our own data. Uh, to, in today's internet world, if you are on the investment side, um, what, what matters the most uh, when you look at investment targets, it's those platforms that actually control data, right? <laughs> it's those big retail um, uh, giant uh, 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 platforms that control retail data. Data is the gold, gold mine today. Um, and, and those data are, are yours and mine, but we don't own those data. Uh, but I, I think over time with the possibility of Bitcoin, which give the money back to, to people. And when you combine that with um, uh, potential other technology development in blockchain and new projects coming up that enable that, I think that will be really uh, powerful, uh, uh, giving, giving people back that ownership of their own assets, giving people back the ownership of their own data, that would be really powerful. They can actually, I think, lead to totally different uh, business formats and uh, uh, social dynamics that we haven't seen today. Um, I mean, there are a lot of a lot of the disbelievers always say, you know, this hasn't happened before, right? But, but a lot of things actually. We see today haven't happened before. That that's how we make progress, um, and I think this is going to be extremely interesting to see. Uh, but back, sorry, back to your point. Uh, what is what is probably in the most powerful uh, 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 marketing line, for example, for Bitcoin? I think it's really kind of you know be your own owner, be uh, own your own asset, own your own financial asset. Uh, I think that would be really powerful. Excellent. Uh, Hong, where can listeners find you online? My Twitter account, it's uh, at HFangCA um, uh, on Twitter. You can also find me or OKCoin at OKCoin.com. And um, I would also particularly say if uh, any of you are interested in learning more about developer, how to um, you know, understand what is going on with the developer community and understand what we are seeing doing here and also give us feedback on how you want us to do to support developer uh, community. Come to uh, our developer page. We have www.developergrant.okcoin.com and um, come back, you know, drop us a, a line, tell us what you think. Um, happy to. Uh, Happy to um, explore what we can do together uh, in that on that front better. Excellent. And listeners, you can find those links in the show notes at stefanlevera.com slash 228 for this episode. And uh, Hong, thanks very much for the work you're doing and supporting Bitcoin development. And thank you for joining me on the show today. Thank you, Stefan. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Make sure you are subscribed to the podcast with your podcast application. I've got an episode coming out with John Newbery, Bitcoin Core developer, next week. So keep an eye out for that one. Thanks, and I'll see you in the Citadels. Yeah.